animal kingdom. Join us for an unforgettable excursion on safari. was but a small part of the great and mysterious dark continent of Africa, where hunters after ivory and rhino horn braved disease and tropical heat in search of fame and fortune. But before the turn of the century, the white rhinoceros was extinct here, and the elephant and the black rhinoceros had almost all been shot out. The hunters had had their day. That was the end of the Age of Annihilation. A time of great adventure, little knowledge, and even less responsibility. In 1961, 65 years after the disappearance of the white rhino from this tropical woodland habitat, two bulls and two cows were reintroduced into the area. That marked the start of one of the biggest success stories in the relocation of endangered animals in the history of conservation. The southern white rhino, the third largest land mammal after the African and Indian elephants, had been given another chance. The habitat, where it had once been shot to extinction, had become a game reserve, the Kruger National Park in South Africa. Do we know about its social behavior or its relationship with the species that share its habitat? The first breeding nucleus of white rhino was settled in the southern district of the Cougar Park. The varied mixes of granite and basalt soils, coupled with a tropical climate and relatively high rainfall, allow the area to support a great diversity of species, which survive because they utilize different aspects of their shared environment. Thus, the seemingly fragile Clipspringer has evolved to withstand the extremes of temperature which characterize the barren granite outcrops that dot the landscape of the south. A browser which is not dependent on daily water, it finds ample food and moisture in the leaves of shrubs like the raisin bush, which have gained a foothold in the crevices between the giant boulders. The buffalo, on the other hand, is a bulk grazer which plays an important role in the grazing succession on the plains. Because it is dependent on daily water, its home range will inevitably include a favorite pool with a mud wallow. The rhino, with its ancient evolutionary lineage, also has a role to play in the grazing succession within its environment. It has survived in its present form only because it is perfectly adapted to its preferred habitat. It too brings its thirst to the waterhole, where despite its size and its obvious strength, it arrives not as the singular species we have come to expect, but as part of the community of species of the area. Here, at the universal meeting place of all that share the environment, the pecking order is rigorously adhered to. 
the warthog, surprisingly, is very high on that order, and all but the largest and most intimidating make way for it. The constant jostling for position is an outward manifestation of the unending competition among species intent on survival. Every available food source within the environment is exploited, even at the water hole. So a water snake in search of food in turn becomes sustenance for the saddlebill stalk. In the process of looking for food, behavior patterns are wrought which are unique to each species. Young baboons cling to their mothers most of the day, but they also have to learn to become independent. A female baboon accompanies her young one to the water hole to drink and turns away for a moment. When the young one is harassed by a juvenile, it suddenly seems to realize that it is alone and tries to find a mother, any mother. Like the baboon troop, the solitary rhino bull is a part of the community of life in this area but he is also part of the social order of the rhinoceros population of the southern district and his status and function within that order depends on whether he is a dominant territorial bull or a subordinate. Subordinate bulls may be immature or older bulls within the population. They differ from territorial bulls mainly because they have no territories but live within the territories of dominant bulls. Despite the mock shows of strength and the token sharpening of horns, they all know the rules. The rubbing and the playful jostling strengthen the bonds within the group. But all subordinate bulls know that they have to display subordinate behavior while they are within the territory of a dominant bull. That means that they do not mark by spray urinating but urinate in a stream between the legs. As long as the subordinate bulls do not challenge the dominant bull or try to mate with a cow in estrus, the dominant bull tolerates them within his territory and they live a relatively trouble-free life. Dominant bulls, on the other hand, represent roughly 3,000 kilograms of prime mating material. Their main object is to defend reserved breeding areas of about 8 to 12 square kilometers against rivals. The boundaries of these territories remain constant even when a dominant bull dies or is displaced. The resident territorial bull reaffirms his dominance in the territory he patrols by scraping his feet and marking the area profusely by spray urinating. He knows whether a rhino entering his territory is male, female, subordinate, or dominant. The tracks of cows with calves are followed with special interest, which is understandable, as the home ranges of cows may overlap as many as seven dominant bull territories. All dominant bulls use specific dung heaps within the territory when defecating. These middens act as smell beacons, and advertise a territorial bull's presence. Normally, subordinate bulls that have been accepted in a territory stay there, because moving from territory to territory could result in confrontations with dominant bulls. A subordinate bull never tries to displace the bull in the territory where it is resident, but if a dominant bull in an adjacent territory should die or become old, the subordinate might take over. Dominant bulls know when they have moved into another bull's territory and they change behavior accordingly. As soon as they enter, they stop marking. Instead, they urinate in a straight stream between the legs like a subordinate bull. Cows also urinate in a stream and the scent of the urine will tell a dominant bull whether the one that has entered his territory is in estrus. Keeping his nose to the ground, the bull follows the track of the cow. But if she moves into another territory before he reaches her, he will not pursue her. At each rhino dung heap, dung beetles busily convert the feces into energy balls in which they lay their eggs. How has the 65-year absence of rhino from the area affected this small world? 
we don't know. Denastony, or rhino beetles, may look like their large namesakes, but they in fact usually breed in any decaying vegetation and have nothing to do with rhino. One of the smaller, true dung beetles might once have filled a niche in rhino dung, but if it did, it became extinct when the rhino numbers diminished. The one exclusive right that the territorial bull has is to mate without disturbance. This is ensured by the strictly demarcated boundaries between territories. Finally, after many a detour to check other tracks, the bull arrives at the spot where the cow has urinated. First, he samples the water, and then, pushing his upper lip outward in a typical show of flimen, he tests whether the cow is in oestrus or not, using the special venero nasal organ in his nose. When a territorial bull finds a cow coming into oestrus in his territory, it will try to keep her there and mate with her. This is the one time when any other bull challenging the right of the dominant bull to mate can find itself in serious trouble because the horn, which is killing the rhino of Africa, is its main defense mechanism. Like the swordsman of old, the bull keeps his weapon honed to perfection, using a number of favorite branches within his territory. Thus, the distinctive curve of both front and back horns of rhino are determined by the branches on which they are honed. Although immature or other subordinate bulls do sometimes attach themselves to cows, they never mate with them, and only the cow and her calf seem to stay together for any length of time, wandering through the home range of the cow in search of grazing and water. At each communal dung heap, the cow stops and smells the dung. Neither she nor any subordinate bull will defecate on the scraped and sprayed dung heaps of the territorial bull, but rather around them. The scents in the dung act as messages on a notice board, and all rhinos passing by will stop to read them and to leave their own calling cards. The calf seems to find more than just the messages in the dung fascinating. Safari will return in a moment. Dwarfed by mountainous glaciers, working in sub-zero temperatures, one family attempts to befriend the Arctic's most fearsome scavenger. Don't miss their Arctic Odyssey on Challenge, Saturday at 8 Eastern, only on the Discovery Channel. Bifocals? I'm gonna look just like my father. My grandfather. Wait. Nobody will notice the lines if I do some cool frames or something. This is not working. For those who refuse to be seen in bifocals, we offer the perfect disguise. Verilux No-Line Bifocals. The vision you need, the look you want, none of the lines. Call for a Verilux professional near you. At Ford Motor Company, we're already building vehicles that meet California's strict emission standards for the late 90s. We're the first U.S. manufacturer to build a car with CFC-free air conditioning. And we'll soon have a fleet of electric vehicles on the road. For us, designing quality cars and trucks means keeping an eye on the big picture. At Ford, we understand that the quality of the environment is one of our greatest responsibilities. Ford Motor Company. Quality is job one. It's working. of tear-free shampoos. The Builder's a new tear-free shampoo. Don't cry. And a detangling conditioner in one. Introducing tear-free Bird Plus for kids. They don't cry. Because what's the point of no tears in the bath? If there are tears afterwards. Girls don't cry. Tear-free Bird Plus for kids. Easy on eyes, touch on tangles. Excuse me, the printer on your desk there, it's an HP laser jet. Uh, why? Never really thought about it. Well, look, somebody obviously thought about it. Somebody with a firm commitment to excellence, right? Probably. Everyone here has an HP laser jet printer. And the fact that you don't think about your HP laser jet kind of proves just how dependable it is, doesn't it? That's a leading question. Are you an attorney? Uh, are you? Yes. 
This is a law firm. There you have it, from an attorney at a leading law firm, HP LaserJet Printers. If it isn't a laser jet, it's only a laser printer. Something is going on that suggests that human beings have abilities to communicate in ways that we do not yet understand. Psychic Powers, Monday at 9 Eastern, only on Discovery Showcase. Where can you find the old-fashioned goodness of fresh milk in clear glass bottles from a nearby family-owned dairy? Mrs. Gooch's, naturally. Presenting Digital Music Express, 30 channels of CD quality music for your stereo. No interruptions, no talk, ever. And for jazz lovers, we offer three great channels. Classic jazz with the greats, light jazz to put you in the mood and big band swing. If you like music, you're going to love DMX, Digital Music Express. Just call us today. Call now for a special offer and free demonstration. And now we return to Safari. Another endangered species that shares this environment with the rhino is the wild dog. They predate mainly on impala in this area, and they are not interested in trying to catch the rhino calf. But anything out of the ordinary sends the calf running to a position just ahead of the cow's horns. A white rhino calf rarely falls prey to predators, mainly because it always runs in front of the cow when it feels endangered. Black rhino calves, which run behind the cows, are more prone to attack from behind, especially by spotted hyena. Whereas the white rhino's social system and the rhino bull's territory stays in place all year round, and his right to mate with cows exclusively is generally accepted, the impala ram has a much more difficult time of it. In this region, impala territoriality reaches its peak in April and May, the mating season. This is when territorial rams try to keep as many ewes as possible in their territories in order to mate with them. But bachelor groups of younger and or older rams constantly hamper their efforts by conducting raids into the territories. Although the younger males have not yet reached peak breeding condition, and the older males are already past their peak, they challenge the already harassed ram. While the fight is in progress, the other males herd the females away from the territory, or the females simply wander off into the territory of another dominant male. In order to get the ewes back, the ram must then enter the territory of the other dominant ram. Because their territories are more loosely defined, fights between impala rams are much more common than confrontations between rhino bulls, and fatalities often occur. As protection, the skin on the necks of impala rams in peak breeding condition becomes noticeably thicker than on other rams, forming a dermal shield for extra protection during fights, thus helping to ensure that only the best will mate. To Impala, the breeding season might be a life and death affair. Others simply couldn't give a darn. As animals use their environment, they also change it. And in the process, they sometimes open up a whole new range of opportunities for other species. A zebra might take a dust bath in an open area, and other animals may follow suit. When the rains come, the small indentation in the dust retains water which attracts species like the warthog, which wallow and enlarge it. Sometimes, it might even provide an opportunity for rare interspecies contact. As the rains continue, the small puddle may in time turn into a pool, which larger species might begin to use. But the rhino do not come alone. A very fortunate dependent of the 
the rhino, the blood-sucking rhino fly, feeds exclusively on rhino and breeds exclusively in rhino dung. When the white rhino became extinct here in 1896, the fly disappeared too. But when the first rhino were being relocated in 1961, flies' eggs in one of the crates hatched and the flies joined their hosts. The nearsightedness of the white rhino is legendary. It gives them an air of vulnerability despite their enormous size. To counteract their lack of vision, they have developed excellent hearing and a symbiotic relationship with the colorful oxpecker birds that warn them of any approaching danger especially in Ann. The oxpeckers are richly rewarded for their watchfulness. They save energy by riding from one feeding ground and waterhole to another. They eat parasites like ticks and flies' eggs that live on the rhino. And most surprisingly, they sometimes even get something to drink between waterholes. Cream clusters of eggs at the base of the horn and on the side of the cheek of most white rhino testify to the presence of another dependent species. One of the largest flies in Africa, the rhino stomach pot, uses the rhino exclusively as its breeding ground. On hatching, the larvae move through the mouth of the rhino into its body, living parasitically as maggots until maturity when they are excreted. The maggots become flies that again lay eggs around the base of the horn and on the cheek. Then die, and the small energy cycle is repeated. Mature white rhino will drink between 40 and 50 litres of water every day, if available. If not, it can go without for three to four days. And the flies and the oxpeckers continue to have their own very reliable private feeding ground. The ever-watchful Grey Lurie is the first to notice the arrival of a less obvious visitor to the seasonal pool. The black mamba has been called the king of African snakes and holds a position comparable only to that of the king cobra in Asia. It is a shy, retiring, though extremely alert snake which is seldom seen in its natural surroundings. Not bound by a rigidly outlined territory, it moves from one retreat to another depending on the availability of food and water. Although it is usually seen in trees when hunting birds or raiding birds' nests, it spends most of its time on hillsides and rocky outcrops where it feeds mainly on rodents and hyraxes. The black mamba, with its coffin-shaped head, is perhaps the most feared of all African snakes because of the volume of neurotoxic poison which it injects into its victims. It is estimated that a 10 to 15 milligram dose of the venom is deadly, but the black mamba discharges 100 to 400 milligrams of venom in a single bite. Because of its exceptional alertness, the supple grace of the mamba drinking undisturbed in the wild is a sight which few have ever seen. The gymnogene, a clumsy bird on the ground, may not be poisonous, but when it comes to hunting birds and small mammals, it can be much more voracious than the black mamba. When the mamba feels threatened, it becomes very nervous and very fast. Safari will return in a moment. Coming up next, a hand is quicker than the rod on the adventurers. Yep, it's a dull, boring morning. 
Samsonite's Adventure Series luggage is perfect for those active vacations. It's sporty, easy to carry, and like every Samsonite, quite durable. The Adventure Series, for all you can pack into a vacation. Say you're a countertop, which would you rather be cleaned with? Soft scrub cleanser with Clorox bleach, which cleans tough stains without harsh scratching, or the kind of powder that's harsh. <laughs> Wise choice. Soft scrub with bleach, preferred by countertops everywhere. <laughs> I've got the worst cold a human being ever had. I've got a major presentation tomorrow. I've got a rest, and I'm out of NyQuil. I could take these, <laughs> but I'd still be up all night coughing, which means I'd be a wreck for the presentation, which means I could get fired. What am I going to do? Go next door like an idiot and ask? Could I borrow a cup of NyQuil? <laughs> Once you know what NyQuil can do, nothing else will do. They're cute, cuddly, and dangerously unpredictable. Travel north to the Arctic Circle for the adventure of a lifetime. Dwarfed by mountainous glaciers, working in sub-zero temperatures, one family attempts to befriend the Arctic's most fearsome scavenger. Don't miss their incredible Arctic Odyssey on Challenge. Saturday at 8 Eastern, only on the Discovery Channel. All she asked for was a photograph and some personal property. And then from that, she led us to where the body was. Something is going on that suggests that human beings have abilities to communicate in ways that we do not yet understand. I saw it clearly, car bursting into flames. I knew Evie was dead. Psychic Powers, Monday at 9 Eastern, only on Discovery Showcase. And now we return to Safari. Because of their body size, most of the rhino day, apart from the midday rest period, is spent grazing. The calf, which starts nibbling and grass when it is about one month old, follows the cow, learning which grasses are the most palatable. Only when it is about six months old will it start grazing in earnest. The wide mouth of the white rhino enables it to consume more grass at a bite than smaller grazers which in turn allows it to shorten its feeding time. The shape of the mouth also enables them to reach even the shortest grass. In this area, where there is abundant grazing available, they prefer the more succulent blue buffalo grass that grows under shrubs and trees. A fully grown white rhino bull is estimated to eat between 35 and 50 kilograms of grass per day. Immature bulls and older calves sometimes attach themselves to cows to form small family groups which graze together, slowly moving towards the favorite clearing for the midday rest. But the rhino calf has no rest in mind. It is determined to try out its newfound strength. A 
obviously deciding that the other bull is more tolerant, the calf launches an attack, its feet scraping dust in a perfect parody of the territorial battle. The subordinate bulls tolerate the presence of the playful calf with remarkable calm. But as soon as they become alarmed, the rhino's tails, a sure indicator of mood, curl upwards and almost immediately afterwards they're on their way. The sleek and elegant cheetah, which once ranged over vast areas of Africa, prefers the more open areas of the savannah woodland because it hunts by sight and with short bursts of speed. It too has lost most of its preferred habitat to man. An elephant stirring and digging in the mud to create the right consistency for a mud bath is a prime example of how animals physically use their environment to suit their needs. elephant disturbs a frog that has burrowed into the mud to keep moist. Its attempts to burrow back are noticed by a water monitor. A spoonbill also filters the water close by for anything that might be trying to escape the pads of the elephant. But the water monitor is successful first. It intercepts the frog. Without realizing it, the elephant has provided the monitor with a meal. Whatever the status or age of the bull or cow in the white rhino hierarchy, there seem to be no restrictions when it comes to the mud wallow. With the exception of the territorial bull, which seems to prefer a solitary mud bath, Bulls, cows and calves of all ages, that are accepted in the territory, come to drink and then wallow to their heart's content. The cow and her calf also visit the communal wallow. Although there is no conflict or confrontation between cows with calves, they do not really form groups and simply seem to prefer being on their own with their calves. But a large, near-sighted mother can turn the simple pleasure of wallowing into a dangerous game of chance. At times like these, one can be forgiven for wishing that one's family had the grace of the greater kudu. Like all rhinos, white rhino calves are rarely completely quiet. The soft vocal sounds seem to indicate to the cow where her calf is at any given time. But even that does not always offer security. Sometimes it's better to simply move away to safer ground. As soon as the cow is ready to move on, the calf returns to her side. Whatever the time of day, 
young rhino calves with their skipping gait and their inquisitive natures always seem to be busy. For birds like the hardy gar, days might be spent looking for food. But for the calf, as for many other young animals in the wild, they are occupied developing instincts like horn rubbing. Of all the species on the African continent, large plant eaters like the elephant and the rhino have the greatest potential impact on their habitat. And in their size lies their greatest dilemma. But whereas the rhino society revolves around a network of relatively small demarcated territories, elephants form large family groups which are structured to roam enormous home ranges through an almost limitless habitat. Moving at will, they once changed and modified the environment, making it accessible to grazers like the buffalo, the zebra and the wildebeest. Now, most of that habitat has gone forever, and the remaining elephant numbers have to be contained in small remnant pockets of their former range, where their tusks, their day-to-day -day tools, become an ever-increasing threat to their survival. Availability of good water determines the movements of the elephant breeding herds that cross the territories of the dominant white rhino bulls. After many years, if there is good grazing in the area, herds of grazers such as buffalo, zebra and wildebeest will stop by and utilize the grazing around water. But not one of these species poses a threat to the white rhino because the physiological structures of each enable them to use different aspects of the same grazing area. Thus, the wildebeest, although it also eats short grass, has to ruminate, while the rhino can continue to feed non-stop. A healthy rhino bull has nothing to fear, even from a large group of lion. But accidents do happen and the records show that twice in 20 years, weakened or sick rhino in the Kruger National Park have been killed by groups of lion hungry enough to take on such formidable power. A grown buffalo is far from being easy prey, but under cover of darkness, these eight male lion have ambushed two buffalo cows, forcing them into the water. The buffalo cows are alive, but trapped in the mud. In order to reach the trapped cows, the lion must cross the mud. The lion are clearly undecided in this unusual situation. They don't seem to know how to go about killing live prey which does not run away. takes the initiative, 
and kills the one cow by putting its paw on her muzzle and smothering her in the mud. The other cow is less fortunate. One of the frustrated lion tastes the blood at the base of the tail where it was ripped off during the chase and starts feeding. The sound of the feeding and the smell of blood excite the lions that have remained outside the mud pool. One lion refuses to go into the water. Preferring the more traditional hunting method, it selects the calf of one of the cows as prey. of Discovery is sponsored in part by HP LaserJet Printers. Excuse me, you're the owner of this place? Yeah, I'm one of them. So you could buy any laser printer you wanted, huh? Well, we bought an HP LaserJet printer. But you could have bought any laser printer. Yeah. Why? Ah, just for the novelty of it? I got enough novelty around here. But isn't buying an HP LaserJet sort of like a, no, a no-brainer? Nah, I think it's kind of like a brainer. HP laser jet printers. If it isn't a laser jet, it's only a laser printer. It will take you to a world of grandeur. Why should I believe in you, Senor Columbus? Where you never ambitious deliver you to a time of wonder. We will work with his people. We want peace. Overwhelm you with the power of the truth. There is something that will never change. I did it. You didn't. Gerard Depardieu in a Ridley Scott film, 1492, Conquest of Paradise, rated PG-13. Starts Friday, October 9th. Okay, say you're a countertop and you find yourself with this blueberry stain. Now, you know there are some kinds of powders that are harsh and can scratch. So, would you want to be cleaned by one of them? Or, would you go for the soft scrub with Clorox bleach, which lifts out tough stains without harsh scratching? So, what's it going to be? A harsh powder or soft scrub with Clorox bleach. Huh. Ooh, wise choice. Soft scrub with bleach. Yeah. Preferred by countertops everywhere. Samsonite's Adventure Series luggage is perfect for those active vacations. It's sporty, easy to carry. And like every Samsonite, 
quite durable. The Adventure Series. For all you can pack into a vacation. Sunday. It's heroes and legends from American history. First, hold back time with William Wyler's classic documentary of patriotism and valor. Take off with the invincible Memphis Belle. Then, honor the man who discovered America. At 10, old world experts ask where Columbus's remains lie. And at 10.30, meet modern revelers keeping his memory alive. Sunday, beginning at 9 Eastern. Where can you find the unsurpassed quality and flavor of Coleman beef? Raised naturally without hormones and antibiotics. Mrs. Gooch's Naturally. Radio stations? Well, if you like Manilow and the Carpenters, there's Coast and K-Big. And if you like Rap and Top 40, there's Kiss and Power. Now, there's a radio station for the rest of us. The new star, 98.7. Superstars of the 80s and 90s. Not a lot of soft, slow songs and not kid stuff over and over. Just great songs. The new star, 98.7. Superstars of the 80s and 90s. Finally, somebody got it right. Now we return to Safari. The one problem with a territory that has to be patrolled all the time is that the bull has to wait for a female in estrus to enter it before he can mate. So, when a cow and calf come to his waterhole, the bull is intensely interested, his whole attitude showing his excitement. He stays with her, trying to cut her off and stop her leaving his territory. Scraping his feet, snorting and marking, he displays his dominant status in the area. She, in turn, shows that she is aware of his superior status by making soft growling and whining sounds. The cow, which is probably only approaching Estrus, moves back into his territory, and for the moment, the bull seems satisfied that he has prevented her from leaving. Sometimes, when a bull is marking, or during a territorial confrontation, he will scrape his horn on the ground as a manifestation of his presence, or to identify status. At a mud wallow, he does the same, to test the consistency of the mud with lip and horn before entering. After wallowing, he again marks the area, repeatedly covering it with his scent.
the rhino is not in the least disturbed by the appearance of the elephant in his territory. After marking on one of his dung heaps, he leaves to join the cow. If she is nearing estrus, he will stay with her for up to two weeks. The mere presence of elephant tuskers and rhino at a waterhole nowadays constitutes a major victory for conservation. For even here, in the Kruger National Park, poachers try to gain a foothold as they continue to target all the natural habitats of Africa. Whereas the elephant is in danger because of its tusks, the rhino is being poached for its horn as well as its testes, which are considered to form the basis of a potent antipyretic drug. Yet the rhino and the elephant represent more than an ancient lineage. They serve as reminders of how large the natural habitats of Africa once were and of how much has already been lost. Normally, during the dry season, white rhino bulls leave their territories in search of water every three to four days. They then move along narrow tension zones, approximately 50 to 100 meters wide, where territories overlap. Most ritual confrontations take place within these tension zones. In one such confrontation, lasting days, this young bull, the smaller of the two involved, makes a nuisance of himself. Although territorial bulls will readily allow other bulls to utilize the water within their areas, they have to display subordinate behavior. In this case, the younger bull does not seem to want to do that. This kind of ritualistic confrontation avoids the expenditure of unnecessary energy on real battle. It establishes dominance through a series of subtle, and in our eyes, sometimes confusing signals. For example, the bull charging, or making the loudest noise, is normally not the most dominant one. The dominant bull normally remains quiet but alert, ears forward. Sometimes he will even walk away, which may give us the impression that he has lost the confrontation. The truth of the matter is that only the most dominant bull can afford to turn his back on an opponent with such a lethal weapon. Over a period of three days, the smaller, younger bull, which is most probably only beginning to show dominant behavior, roars and charges, challenging the bigger, more dominant bull in the overlapping area between the territories proper. But the young bull will have to find himself another territory. that the white rhino population in the Kruger National Park is flourishing. More and more territories are being established away from the original nucleus. The white rhino of the Kruger Park is fast becoming the biggest breeding population in the world. But what of the black rhino? In 1945, the last footprints of the black rhinoceros finally faded to extinction in the Kruger National Park and only gifts from the Natal Parks Board and Zimbabwe made relocation possible again in 1971. Now, black rhino numbers are on the increase, and there is room for them to grow because the carrying capacity for black rhino in the Kruger Park is even higher than for white rhino. There is hope for the black rhino, but then the habitat must remain secure.
today, the hunting ground where the rhinos were once annihilated is one of the oldest and most famous game reserves in the world. Few now remember how nearly its rich diversity was lost forever. Few can imagine how easily it could happen again. Fortunately, as they evolve through time, people are beginning to realize that they are not masters of all they survey. They're beginning to realize that they too are a part of the integrated ecology of the Earth, and that the survival of remaining natural habitats, such as the Kruger National Park, should not only be the responsibility of those who hold them in trust, they demand a commitment from all the people of the world. big amps attachments on board to clean anywhere traps the dirt keeps it here new power line by eureka yep it's a dull boring morning 65 degrees no wind no clouds dull yeah. 